Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Woods, the Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 1997. Tonight, we are presenting the final episode of Dr. Helen Rothberg's Wednesday Wisdom Live series. It is entitled More Than a Feeling and includes the recipe for RJR Slushy Comfort, which can be made as a mocktail or a cocktail. If you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone. We've provided that number and code in the chat box. We can do it again if you just logged in uh, a minute ago. Due to the number of participants, we have muted all lines except for Helen's and mine. So uh, if you do have any technical questions, please put that in the chat box and we'll answer that for you. If you have questions for Helen, please do not send her a private message as she's not going to see it while she's presenting. So please send the message to the host in the Q&A feature and I'll make sure that gets to Helen when she's ready for questions. There are several ways you can view the presentation on your screen. If you hover over the top right corner of the video portion of your screen with your mouse, this would be different clearly on a mobile device, but um, mobile device, you're gonna see Helen, but I would choose the active speaker view if you are using a desktop. Helen is not showing any slides. That way you'll see full screen Helen. There'll be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar with five questions. It'd be very helpful to us for our future planning if you could send us your feedback. And now I'd like to introduce our host, Dr. Helen Rothberg is a professor of strategy at Marist. In addition to her professorship at Marist, she is senior faculty at the Academy of Competitive Intelligence and is principal of HNR Associates. She has published extensively with Scott Erickson on topics including competitive intelligence, intellectual capital management, and knowledge management. Helen's latest book, The Perfect Mix, Everything I Know About Leadership I Learned as a Bartender, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2017 and is now in its third printing. With Scott Erickson, she has also published Intelligence in Action, Strategically Managing Knowledge Assets by Palgrave Macmillan in 2012, and Knowledge to Intelligence, Building Advantage in the Next Economy by Elsevier 2005. And now I'd like to welcome Helen for number six of Wednesday, Wednesday Wisdom Live. I'm trying to say that wow. five times fast. Quickly, thank you. Um, just once again, thank you to Amy Woods and Donna Feldman and the whole crew in uh, the alumni support group uh, for giving us this opportunity to be together. So hi, Red Foxes, family, friends, colleagues. Um, so nice to have you join me uh, again today for Wednesday Wisdom Live. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about more than a feeling. Um, and using our advice model that comes from that little yellow book over there, The Perfect Mix, we're gonna be speaking about empathy. Um, just to remind you of where we've been and what we've done and how we've gotten here, um, this whole series has been about how to lead yourself and how to lead yourself in uncertain times or really any time of your life. And the advice model is the guide for doing that. So A is action. It's about doing more and saying less. And we talked about the choice you could make at looking at those things out of your control as either shit or fertilizer, right? Choosing how you can respond and find an opportunity in a silver lining. The D in advice, determination, getting things done, having the grit and, and the stick to and the drive um, and getting things done with civility and ingenuity. Um, the vision, understanding what your true north is and what you're reaching for, for yourself, for your community, for your nation, for your family, and using that as the driver for the choices you make about the different activities you're gonna engage in. The I in the advice model, integrity. Tell the truth all the time and don't play into drama. Um, and even if you do, because you're human, as we all are, and nothing is perfect, own what's yours and then let it go and forgive yourself. Last week, we spoke about communication, the C in advice, and how difficult it is for both the sender of information and the receiver of information 
to create meaning and understanding. And the way to really do that is by having the intention to be present so that you can create meaning with your message in mind and you can hear a message with the intention that it was set. Tonight, we go full circle and talk about empathy. Um, the ability to understand and feel what somebody else is feeling. And one point I'd like to make about leading yourself in the advice model, all these different ingredients, if you will, um, they influence each other. And they're always present when you're trying to take yourself to a new place. So let's talk about empathy. Understanding how others feel. Um, there's a couple of different ways to look at empathy. Um, the work by uh, Dan Goldman and Paul Ekman, one of emotional intelligence and the other of social intelligence, tells us there are three ways to think about empathy. Empathy can be cognitive, where you can really understand somebody else's perspective. Empathy could be emotional, where you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes and understand them from that perspective or empathy can be compassionate, where you're so moved by the first two that you actually do something, right? The full circle, you take an action um, because of what you're feeling and understanding about somebody else's circumstance. And, you know, why, why should we care about empathy? Why should, why should life and organization care about empathy? Why should leaders care about empathy? Um, Organizations have their own personality and soul. And we could talk about organization stories and culture, but all of that really is made up of the people inside of it. And each person has their own personality and their own stories. And it's in those stories that you can really understand who you're working with so that everything works better. If we look at what an organization really is, it's an exchange. It's an exchange between our know-how as the worker, what we do, and the organization's payment for our services. That's one kind of exchange. But if we really want to develop a deep connection to the people we work with and the place we work with, a real leader will take that exchange even farther and not just look at it as, am I fairly compensating somebody for what it is that they're exchanging with the organization, the work they're providing. But am I also nurturing them? And am I also helping them achieve their dream? See, when we help people grow and become the best that they can be while they're working with us and, and in our organizations and in our communities, because we have empathy and we understand them, then everybody really quote unquote wins because in this exchange, when you develop empathy, you develop understanding. And when you develop understanding, that's the only time you really can develop the right action. How do we know what actions to take? How do we know how to really help someone if we don't understand who they are, what their stories are, if we haven't stepped into their shoes? And if we can create the right action, what do we get in return? We develop trust. We develop loyalty. We have teams that can work better together, even in difficult situations. We develop uh, happiness. Yeah, it is possible to have happiness or joy or contentment at work. And we develop more creativity because people are feeling nurtured and a little bit more open and they trust their leader and they're gonna try new things and be innovative. Um, as we care, as we have empathy, we, we, we also care, right? Caring is about paying attention. It's about noticing um, what's going on around you and then having the empathy to want to do something with it. And it could really be quite powerful. So in my capstone classes, uh, those of you who don't know me from the academic side, I teach a class in strategy, it's the final class or the major uh, in business. Um, I have a very demanding program and a bunch of years back, um, part of that program required that uh, each student write their own 
10,000 word strategic plan for a company. It was something that had to get started really early in the semester if, it, if you had a chance of really finishing it. So people would come to my class and one semester I had a crew of four. And of that crew of four, one was in the night class and the other three were in the day class. Uh, very, very close friends. Gabe Gambino, I'm calling you boys out. Kevin Hunker, um, Justin Murray, and Jake Jacobson, also known as Mr. Marist. And the three, Gabe Hunker, that's what we call Kevin and Jake, were actually in the day class together. And I have a set of rules that you have to follow if you're in my class. Um, and one of them is really difficult for the millennial and the Z generation. And that rule is, I don't want to see your phone and I don't want to hear your phone unless I ask you to take it out to calculate something. And if I did see or hear your phone, you got um, the most stringent punishment. Uh, in those days, my mom was still alive. Her name was Frida. And Frida, if you've ever seen Seinfeld and you know the character of Seinfeld's mother, well, she was a pussycat compared to my Frida Rothberg. My mother was a, a strong person who was really very playful in her own way and loved to give people the business. So if I heard your phone for whatever reason, I would stop class immediately and you had to call Frida. And for five minutes, Frida would give you the business. And the first thing Frida would say to you is, what'd you do wrong? And she'd then grill you. Um, and if by chance Frida wasn't there when I made you call her, um, she would call you later because she learned how to use her phone. So my students could be in the middle of doing anything. They could be studying, they could be at the bar, they could be taking a nap, and Frida would call them and bug them. So right away, one of the crew, of course, violated the first rule and they had to call Frida. And they fell in love with Frida. So sometimes they would ask friends to call them um, just so the phone would ring and they could call Frida again. If it was somebody's birthday, they would tell us it was their birthday and we would call Frida and Frida would sing to them the birthday song. And um, this really made a very old lady quite happy and it tickled the crew. Well, that same semester, um, some of the crew were having trouble getting the paper done. We, uh, we had to invoke certain kinds of rules like, okay, um, call me every day and tell me where you are on your paper, literally. Uh, and one of the crew would call me uh, every day. And if I didn't hear from this person, even if it was Saturday night at 1030, I would email them and say, where are you? I need a report, right? We were in this together. I empathized with the situation these students were in. First of all, they didn't ever have such a demanding plate as the one I put in front of them. Two, they hadn't really worked with real companies before in this way and done such depth research. I, I had cognitive empathy for them. I could sense what they were experiencing. And you know what? I also had emotional empathy for them. I have four graduate degrees. Don't ever do that, by the way. But I have four graduate degrees, so I know what it's like to feel overwhelmed and have all these other classes and not be sure what you're doing and needing a little extra TLC. And I had compassionate empathy because I created what we called the Aunt Helen program. And I would make them call me and everybody got through and everybody passed. But during this same semester, um, my dad had taken very, very ill. And he died that semester, the day before the Thanksgiving break. It's almost a rule in my family that you die on Thanksgiving because everyone's together anyway, and you don't want to bother everybody to travel to a funeral. Another story for another book. Um, but I wound up not coming in to collect the papers. A colleague of mine did that for me and explained what was going on. And the class really, they were so empathetic to me. They were beautiful. They they wrote this beautiful card and everybody signed it and boxes of their papers came in um, and they were very gracious to me when I came back to class and the semester ended really beautifully. But then it went beyond that because the crew really through their actions showed me that they 
understood from an empathetic point of view of where I was at, that they emotionally could feel it and that they were compassionate to me and my family. And they did the most extraordinary thing. Uh, as soon as they were done with their finals, which is usually the time when um, drinking and all kinds of debauchery would usually occur. Uh, they jumped into one our SUV, all four of them. They drove to the assisted living facility in Goshen, New York, an hour away where my mother was living. And they spent a good part of the afternoon with her. And you had to see this, this little feisty old lady. At that point, my mother might have been 90 pounds. And these boys of varying heights and widths cramming into her little room and hugging her and kissing her and making Frida feel like she was the most special person in the world. And it made me feel like I was the most special person in the world, that my students would take that time out of their lives and show that kind of kindness to my mother and to myself. Pure empathy supported by action in the most beautiful way. And I do, I get teary every time I think about it. So when we think about daring to care, you know, we're all people walking through this earth together and living in organizations together and trying to get things done. And even if we're physically in each other's presence or we're distanced from each other as we are now and just connecting through the screen, we still can bring our best for each other. We still can feel for each other. We still can be there for each other. So I have two poems for you today. It's a special day. Here's from Gibran, the prophet. If you can only own one book in your whole life, I tell everybody I know this, this is the book you should own by the Sufi master Gibran. And I'm paraphrasing from the final piece of his, his poem on friendship. And let your best be for your friend. If he must know the ebb of your tide, let him know its flood also. For what is your friend that you should seek him with hours to kill? Seek him always with hours to live. For it is his to fill your need, but not your emptiness. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. So because I was shown this understanding and this empathy by my crew, Dave Gambino, Kevin Hunker, Justin Murray, Jake Jacobson, um, I am now theirs for life, loyalty, trust. I've been to Gabe and Katie's wedding. I have helped Hunker and Jake a number of times when they were making career changes or in their resumes. I have emailed with Justin when he had questions and I will be a servant to them for the rest of my life because of the empathy and care that they showed me. Well, there's another side to empathy that we forget about. And it's about empathy for the self. It's about knowing when to say enough. I, I've done enough or I've had enough or I am enough. We forget about that pieces of ourselves. We should be able to engage with the people we love and care about with the best of us, not with what's left of us. I could remember many days in my life where I was just running on fumes. And why does the tank have to be empty before we decide that we're worthy enough to stop and breathe. Um, Paula Kahlo, who wrote a book, The Alchemist, and another book everybody should read, says, when you say yes to others, make sure you are not saying no to yourself. There needs to be time also to have empathy for yourself, to give yourself the space to be wrong, to give yourself the space to rest, to give yourself the space to be perfect, to care enough about yourself to know when to say no. It's a very hard word. I, I have some executives that I've coached where I had to literally make them 
repeat after me. No, until they got used to how the word sounded on their tongue, because we're so free. If we don't show up and we're not there, we're not saying yes to everything, people will think less of us. But you know, maybe they'll think a little bit more of you. Maybe you'll be setting an example. And even if none of that is true, there is nothing more important than caring for yourself and having empathy for yourself. And for that, I bring you um, Mary Oliver from A Thousand Mornings. It's called today. And I think for me personally, it might be my tomorrow. Today, I'm flying low and I'm not saying a word. I'm letting all the voodoos of ambition sleep. The world goes on as it must. The bees in the garden rumbling a little, the fish leaping, the gnats getting eaten and so forth. But I'm taking the day off, quiet as a feather. I hardly move, though really I'm traveling a terrific distance. Stillness, one of the doors into the temple. And the temple is you and your energy. And when we step back, especially now during these very intense times, and even if you can only find that 20 minutes, then that's the time to take for yourself and breathe. So I have actually someone here helping me today a little bit so we could share our toes. Because you know what? Part of empathy is knowing that sometimes you just can't do everything by yourself. And it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, I need you with me today. So to my helper, thank you, a fellow Red Fox, believe it or not, I share with you the RJR baby bourbon, yes bourbon, um, slushy, RJR, Russell Joseph Rothberg, um, my partner in life, my younger brother, who's really the 3,000 year old Buddha, whose favorite thing as a kid growing up for his birthday was a chocolate cake with peanut butter icing. And I figured out how to do it and tried to provide that as often as I could. He has now transferred that into a luscious cocktail. So put in some almond milk. We use a magic bullet in this family, or you could use a ninja, or you could use a blender. Almond milk, half a banana, big, nice, luscious scoop of peanut butter, because there's never enough peanut butter. Two to three scoops of chocolate ice cream. We got the very international box made haagen -Dazs. And about two fingers of bourbon. Whip it all up, have a whiff. If you feel it needs to be a little healthier, you could put an orange rind. I didn't want to ruin the absolute comfort that I'm going to allow myself in this drink and say to all of you first, thank you for joining me for the last six weeks. I hope I've been helpful. And please never forget, lead yourself because you can, and it's time. Please remember your school, your college, Marist College. We need you, incoming students need you, faculty need you, and even more than that, dare to care about others and yourself. Cheers. That is just so good, I think I'm calling it dinner. Do I have a milk mustache now? <laughs> I don't see it. Okay. Think about so video. Video hides some things. Delish. I want to let you know some of those names you mentioned happen to be joining tonight. I can see their names there. So. Oh boy. Uh, if any of them, you know, want to, oh, see, one's chiming in right now. I can turn their mics on. <laughs> Can I keep my drink for this one? Helen, out of those four fellas, um, they seem like quite gentlemen. Out of the fab four, who is your favorite? <laughs> I have no favorites. I love mean, my children equally. <laughs> and they're all going like this. Bullshit. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can yeah, I can picture it. Mm-hmm. Um, good question.
question related to the current pandemic and what you were speaking about. If you've only been working with a team virtually, how do you show care or have empathy if you've only known them virtually? Take time to get to know them. Thank you for the question and take time to learn their story. You know, one of the things I've been recommending, I've been working with some companies right now on the consulting side, you know, running some pretty intense analyses and how do you do that? How do you build that? How do you get people to share what they know? And well, you take time to get to know them. And there's a couple of practices that I use that might be helpful. One is in the beginning of, of every meeting while you're getting to know each other, we do something called, you could use a feather or really just a pencil. It's called a wisdom circle. And everybody gets a minute to just say where they're at that day or what's important to them that day. And nobody gets to say anything and you all, no one could speak unless you're holding the pencil and then you pass it to the next person. And what it does, it starts to help people get to know each other. You know, sometimes we can have a really bad day. And if this is a team you're first getting to know and they don't know you, they're going to just think you're one of those people as opposed to, you know, you know, my, my kid, you know, got into something today and I now have jelly all over the wall and I can't get it off. And, you know, who knows what it is. There's so many things happening around us now. So if we each take a little bit of time to learn about what's our situation. How are we living? Who's there with us? How's it going? Um, maybe occasionally even doing an informal, um, whenever it works for everybody, zoom drink, whether it's a, a tea, a coffee or a cocktail, just try to build some relationship and then once you get to know people you then can begin to notice if something isn't right and see what you can do to be helpful thank you if anyone online has a question for dr rothberg feel please feel free to send it through the q a box to the host uh, and i can get that over to helen so helen if your organization isn't very empathetic and demands a lot from you, how do you practice self-care in that situation? Oh boy, do we know do we know that one is Red Fox is right? Maris is a demanding place to work. Um, we that's part of the beauty of being there is that we care so much about every detail, it means that we're kind of always turned on. And I think it's really important to have the courage to create a boundary with your organization. There have to be some boundaries because if you have something that I call the curse of competence and you're a good worker and you prove you get things done and you get them done right and on time, they're always gonna turn to you when they need something. So it's, it's learning when to say no. It's learning that if there's something that you have to do with your family, that's really important that you do that. And you know what? There probably aren't many boundaries and lines you need to create, but if your organization can't respect that, you might want to think about working for a different organization. Thank you. You're welcome. What about the line between self-care and being selfish? Where's that line? Oh, what a good question. So, Self-ish really could be self-care. Um, being selfish is when you're only taking care of yourself without regard for anyone else. So let me give you an example of self-care and selfish. Self-care. Most of us have been on an airplane. We have all been told that if there's an emergency and the air masks drop, put your air mask on first and then on your child or your companion or anyone you're helping. You're no good helping somebody else if you have no oxygen. The selfish person is only putting on their air mask, right? They're really not gonna expend any energy above and beyond to help anybody else. So self-care to recharge, to take a day, to read something, to do something a certain way, to not engage with something is very different than only doing those things that are going to always personally serve you. And if you're in an organization 
you're agreeing to be of service, right? That's why organizations exist because they can't get all the work done by themselves. So that line is, why am I really saying no? Is it because I really just need something for me or it doesn't serve me enough to be worthy of my time? And that's going to be a different line for everyone, but again, put your mask on to help someone else or are you only putting it on for yourself? That's a good way to think about it. Uh, along the same topic, uh, this was submitted by one of our attendees. I have a feeling you know who it is. Uh, a lot of organizations tend to feign empathy, empathy in their own interests. If you're in the process of searching for a new job or organization, what are some ways to identify organizations that value empathy and put the action behind their words? That's such a great question and they answered it in the question. That's why our students are so smart and do so well, right? Or alumni. Um, see what they do, not what they say. You know, empathy isn't words. Words, you know, empathy is action. It's what have you also done? So if a company claims that they care about the environment, that they're going green, what have you done to prove that? Um, which should be more than you're recycling your water bottles, right? Or you're giving everybody, you know, one of these things so they don't buy water bottles. You want to see a long-term commitment in their strategic plan. You want to see who's on their board. So it's really understanding what a company does. And then you could also always ask if you get to interview with them, you know, do they support their employees engaging with their community, um, being part of a not-for-profit, helping a charity of, of their, of, that they feel close to. So it's it's doing that kind of investigation. And I bet um, if we Googled it, because I don't know offhand, somewhere there might even be some kind of report card by some kind of organization that actually rates companies and how they respond to different kinds of issues of our day. Um, and that might give you a flavor too. Also, be careful when you look at other sources like Glassdoor, for instance, people tend to post more about whining than liking something. Um, it gives you a flavor, but, um, you know, just, just see what they do and who they're involved with and find articles about them. And I would look at it that way. Thanks. I think that's it for now. Okay. So Helen, as this is the final episode of this series, I just want to raise a toast to you. Thank you. Can we, can we clink? Clink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know there are countless alumni who would like to share their gratitude with you for being their teacher and mentor over the years. And they've immensely shared spending these Wednesday evenings with you. So hopefully in the future, we've talked about this, we'll do something new, you know, maybe start up in the fall or winter. With something else, as I have a feeling we'll be doing virtual programming for a while now. <laughs> Possibly. Well, I, am, I am starting to work through the next book, which is about making relationships at work work. And the first book was actually started in its real belief through the Emerging Leaders Program with Robin Torres and her people. So you know, maybe this will be the impetus for me to start really working on that next book with all of you. So thank you for that invitation. Nice. Yeah. And to our guests, thank you for joining us tonight and for keeping the Maris Alumni Association in your life during these troubling times. Uh, there will be a full recording of this webinar as well as Helen's past five webinars available within a few days on our website. So we have it uh, linked from the Maris Alumni website right over to our YouTube channel. Um, I'm actually gonna paste the links in our chat box right now to our upcoming events page and the past recordings page. Okay, and I'll, I'll also post the, a link to the recording on my LinkedIn page. Perfect, yes. Um, so I think that's there. We had a few people send their thank yous in. Thank you from Ava and Joey, Helen. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Hunker's on. Yes, I know there are others that you know. So, um, giving everyone hugs, <laughs> virtual hugs, to virtual, all. virtual hugs. Um, but I think that's it, right, for this evening. That's it. Thank so you. Thanks, everybody. Stay well. Everyone, stay well. 
Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.